to our first of the three uh, sacraments of initiation, and we'll uh, take a peek at those, okay? Now, I gave a handout, folks, a one-pager, and I hope that helps you with your notes, so if you have that, that'd be something to refer to as we go through them. And then you don't have to write everything down, because we try to summarize some of those things there, okay? The first thing I'll do, and I'm, you don't, might not have a catechism, I do, and we, we'll open it, we print it up here. So in your catechism, if you were to turn to, just to get you started, we'll do the first one, okay? So CCC means Catechism of the Catholic Church. So when you see us do abbreviation, CCC, and there's page numbers in here, but then there's paragraph numbers. And so we would go with the paragraph number 12, 13, okay? I'll find that. If you ever get the tabs, they have tabs like in a Bible, and you can just turn to the tab that says baptism, and then you'd be right there. But if not, you're on page number, let's go to page number 342, if you don't have the tabbies or whatever. If you went to page 342, you'll be able to find 1213. And I'll read it for you. Here it is. I think that, yeah, there's more to there than that. Holy baptism, holy baptism is the basis of the whole Christian life. It is the gateway to life in the spirit and the door which gives access to the other sacraments. You know, we had the seven up there, and the only way to get the other six is to be baptized. So that's why we call it the gate sacrament. So when you enter through the gate, now you're in the household of God, and you have access to those other vehicles of help that he wants us to have. So it is the gate sacrament, or the door, that gets us into um, his family. Through baptism, we are freed from sin and reborn as sons of God, sons and daughters, and we become members of Christ's body, are incorporated into the church, and made sharers in her mission, her, the church's mission, okay? So that's, that's so important. The basis of the whole Christian life, the door to the other sacraments. And so what does scripture have to say? And, uh, you know, Nicodemus and John, early John, John chapter 3, the Jew Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, and he says, what must I do to get into heaven? And Jesus says, you must be born of water and the Holy Spirit. And this is one of many references in Scripture that show the essential nature of baptism. You must be born of water and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at depth, why, why in just a minute. Okay, in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, um, Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So it goes back to that question, you know, are you saved, okay? You can make that profession with your mouth and believe in your heart, but Jesus is saying there's more. So for you to turn to Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, and say, that's all I need to do. That is, why do you have 73 books in the Bible? There's other things, you know. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless you forgive one another from your heart. Amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you will not have eternal life. So there's more. And so what, our, what Jesus is saying here, whoever believes, that's number one, and then is baptized, will be saved. You're on the journey. And then in the Acts of the Apostles, um, Peter, he gives his first homily. And the people, it says, Scripture says, uh, Luke says, he's writing the Acts, and he says, they were cut to the heart. What must we do, they say to Peter. And Peter says, repent every one of you, and be baptized. And so baptism is essential, okay? If you're not baptized and you're in this class, we believe in three baptisms. The baptism of water, the baptism of desire. God forbid something happens to you before you're baptized, but you're here and you're saying, man, I want to be in your family. I don't want to be baptized. The, the church would affirm that there is the baptism of desire and then the baptism of blood. Those are the three ways to be baptized. If you remember that Columbine thing, you know, that awful thing that happened and the girl's under the desk and he says, do you believe in Jesus? And she said, yeah, and he shot her. We would say that the blood of martyrs baptizes them. I mean, that's, that's a, that's, that would be sufficient to say that the, the girl was baptized, okay? Baptism by water is the most prevalent. Baptism by desire and then baptism by blood. So baptism is essential. So. Let's please go to the next one, okay? Let's see. Good deal. Okay. When we look at these sacraments, folks, to help you get your grasp on what you're going to see and everything, is we believe for each sacrament there's what's called matter and form, okay? What is the visual sign? Like you saw those power lines, okay? What is the visual sign that would indicate that power is flowing? And then what is the form of the sacrament? 
which is many times words, okay? So in this sacrament of baptism, as you know, um, it is water. And so uh, that is uh, chosen by God, you know, um, that's how John the Baptist was baptizing, and that's how the apostles were not baptizing after that. And why do you think we use water, okay? That's the matter, that's the element, okay? And so there's two good reasons why God chose the element of water. And let's take a peek, okay? I think that uh, one is cleansing. You know, we're going to go a little faster just because we want to cover so very much. Mm -hmm. But you know water, you know. You get up in the morning, you wash your face, you know, you wash your hands through the day, you want it to be clean. And so water is an element that we use to get cleansing, to get cleanliness, okay? We wash our clothes, and we wash our children, and we wash our pets. So it's this cleansing effect and life-giving, okay? It's a life-giving effect. You know that many of you are drinking water. You chose to drink water. And even if it's tea, that's flavored water. And so without water, we die. There's no planet out there that's going to have life without water, okay? So water represents life, and you must be hydrated. You have to water your lawn, you water your pets, you water yourself. And so when God shows the element of water, the two signs of what's happening to our soul is we're being washed of sin and we're being nourished with life-giving Holy Spirit, okay? So that's why water is chosen. And so when the water is used and the form is said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we're following exactly what Jesus asked us to do at the last of Matthew, Matthew 28. He says, go. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So that's the last command of Jesus in Scripture. And he's sending out his apostles to make his family really big. One father, one family. If everybody is baptized and enters the household of God, that's what he wants. Okay? And so, there it is. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. That's what we do. We preach to it all the time. Okay, with regard to baptizing people. Um, so let's take a look at a few more important things here. In this. Who is it that uh, performs baptisms? Okay, We have the hierarchy, and we're going to talk about this in Holy Orders, but there's three levels. It's in Scripture, and it's in all of the early church fathers, like Ignatius. You know, there is a bishop, there is a priest, and a deacon. Okay, The episcopos, you know, and the uh, presbyterate, and then the uh, diaconia, the men of service. And so these three levels have the permission to go ahead and baptize. And guess what? In an extreme emergency, you have the power to baptize, okay? So, car accident by the side of the road, 30-year-old guy's there, and he's gonna die. He says, I've never been baptized. If you had access to water, you could take water and pour it over him and say, I baptize you, call it by name, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it is done. Only in extreme situations such as that, and so, uh, wow, just you need to know that. And if for some reason you're injured and you're being taken to the hospital to have an awareness of the spiritual well-being that you are, or your children, or your friends, and then call for a minister or, or, or have this in mind to do that, okay? So the next one, please. How many times are we baptized, you know? And when I talk to other faith traditions and so forth, and, and they want to come into Catholic Church, they say, well, I was baptized at 16 in this church, and then I was baptized over here, and I was baptized over here. And we as Catholic Christians, we believe that you're baptized once. Once. You're adopted once. Once you're in God's family, you're in God's family. There's different ways to live that out, different faith traditions, but you only get baptized once. Something is happening to your soul, that gift of adoption, just one time. And so we refer, as one reference, Ephesians, okay? So this is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. And in the fourth chapter, he says, you know, we're striving to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, one body, one Spirit, as you are also called to the one hope of your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so as far as... If you were baptized in this room and you're not a Catholic, but you want to live out your faith tradition and our tradition, we don't baptize again. You are baptized. And so we reference that we normally ask for a certificate or some notation to be sure that you know you're baptized and maybe even know your baptismal date. I remember I was in my 30s and I'm in the pew and the father's up there and he says, do you know the date of your baptism? I thought to myself, gosh, I don't, I don't. And so I went right home and called mom and she pulls out the certificate and, you know, it was born on May 1st and it was baptized on June 7th. And that's the greater birthday. And I celebrate it every year. June 7th is the day I was born again. 
And so, you know, to think that you would, if you don't know, to research the day you were born again, that's a really beautiful day to celebrate. We're born, and then we're born again. Two birthdays. And uh, so what we do here is um, we, would, we would want to uh, cherish that moment and uh, remember. So if you're non-Catholic, we want to know where's your certificate, who, who and when baptized you, so that you know, so that you know. We don't know, because many of us were baptized as infants, and so thanks God, Mom and Dad keep these documents. Now, if you were baptized at, as where you remember, maybe you were 16 and you were baptized, and uh, you remember that, but you don't have a record, then we would use what's called an affidavit. You know, maybe Mom was there or Dad, and we just say, I verify that my son at the age of 16 was baptized, and then we're sure that it happened. We want to be sure grace is flowing, and that's why we ask for the baptism, to be sure you're in the family, and it's uh, good. So that's we, if you're not sure, we would conditionally baptize you. We, I would say, on the condition that you're not baptized, I baptize you in the name of the Father or Son. So if you were never baptized, then something happens to your soul. If you were baptized, nothing happens to your soul. But we've covered ourselves. We've covered ourselves, and so, or covered you, you know, to be sure that you were born again into God's family. Okay. Okay. What are the effects of baptism? What happens? What is what is God doing to the soul? Okay. So first of all, it removes sin. And so as a little infant, when we Catholics, we baptize little babies, and there is no sin. There is original sin, which is the stink of Adam and Eve's disobedience that every human being carries when they're born. It's sin. We didn't do it. It's called the original sin of our first parents. And so that is washed away in baptism. And then there's actual sin. I have baptized men in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and women too, where they're in church, they can hardly stand up, and they're leaning over the pew, and I come forward because they ask for it, and we baptize them. And you can be baptized as a person that's lived a full life, and all of your sins are washed away. Wow, wow. So we call actual sin is an actual thing where you actually committed it. You know, you did it with understanding, and you did it with desire, will, so intelligence and will. And so that's something that needs to go before you enter the kingdom of heaven. And so if you're baptized right before you die, then all that goes away. And so how many of you know the actor from one generation ago, John Wayne? Remember John Wayne? Do you remember John Wayne? Yeah. I mean, not too long ago. He had many military movies and many um, cowboy movies and all of that. So he's in the hospital late in life, and he's suffering badly. And he said to the nurse, he said, you know, I've led a rough life. I'm not denying that. And uh, through the nurse was Catholic. And through her counsel and everything, he asked to be baptized. And John Wayne was baptized on his deathbed, and then he died. How's that for riding off into the sunset? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you knew when you were going to die, then you could do it that way. You could just say, well, I'm going to live the best I can, but all these sins that I've accumulated, I'll just be there, and they're gone. You know, they're washed away. But we don't know when we're going to die, as, you, as this uh, basketball player just discovered in his daughter's like, you just You don't want to play games with God. I'd love to be in your family now. I want your Holy Spirit here now. I'm not going to wait till I'm 80 years old and then have your Holy Spirit in my spirit. No, and so we do the best we can, and that's why those other sacraments are there to help us recover when we mess up. Okay. So the effects of baptism. Okay. The other is the indwelling. Remember, we said water washes. Okay. So it washes away sin, and then water nourishes. Okay. And so in comes God's Holy Spirit to nourish us with His Spirit which is perfect and which is all holy. And so that's the effects of baptism. You're born again, and now that your soul is clean, his Holy Spirit can take up residence in your soul. Okay? So infant baptism, we talk about that. You know, I just referred to uh, Matthew and even Mark, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them. Jesus never put an age limit. He never commanded you to uh, baptize at a certain age or never denied that you could baptize at a younger age. And so... Uh, infant baptism. Can we please go back to that? I don't know that I covered it well. Please, Joshua. Okay. Jesus says, go and make disciples. Oh, there you go. I'm with you. Okay. So he's commanding us to do that. And let's go to the next one then. And uh, Yeah, he placed no age limit on receiving the gift. It is a gift. That's the first thing I say when I instruct people in baptism. We don't deserve this. And we can't earn it. It is a huge gift. Eternal life. Eternal happiness with God in heaven. The ability to be home forever with him, that's a gift. And so infants have no actual sin, but they do have original sin. And God is doing the work. You know, we don't do that, you know. We can, 
admit that we believe in him and so forth, but that's not part of this. Um, uh, how many times in scripture that a person was cured, remedied, or had their sin washed away because of the belief of someone else? We're going to talk about that in a minute. And so when your parents and godparents think the greatest gift I could ever give my child is to get them started on the way to heaven and be baptized, like I say, I was five weeks old, and uh, I have baptized babies in the incubator where they were at risk of living, and I take sterilized water, and I reach in the incubator, and I pour it over their little tiny head, and I baptize them in the incubator because the parents are just in tears, and the nurses, oh, we got to make sure this baby is born again so that the baby would go right to, to God, all pure, all holy. Okay, there we go, and then in the baptism. Yet yeah, Jesus offered bestowed the grace based on the faith of others, and I think we put some examples here, if we could. In Matthew, remember this centurion, you know, he says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you are under my roof. Say just the word, and my servant will be healed. And God, Jesus, healed the servant, and he, the servant wasn't even there. So based on the intercession and the prayers of the centurion, his servant was healed. And I think we have one more. You know, remember when on the roof, you know, they couldn't get in to see Jesus, so the guys are on the roof, and they lower the little uh, bed there, and the guy is in front of them, too. And so the guy got there because the four guys brought him there. And then Jesus said, rise, you know, pick up your mat. And he cured them based on the faith of the other guys that brought him there. So those are little examples that we have parents and then we have godparents. And so it's customary to have a man and woman in my family that were five. And we all had a different aunt and uncle. And they were our, our godparents. And so they're our spiritual guide and special aunt and uncle for the rest of our life. It's really a great thing to have godparents uh, to help you on your journey. Okay. And so we say, God doing the work, why delay? Okay, we have to, the three things to get to, to get to heaven, you have to come to Jesus, you have to believe in Jesus, and you have to be born again. In these two, we do it. In being born again, he's doing it. And so if he's doing it, why would we wait? And that's what I said here, why delay? We still have to come to Jesus and believe with Jesus and walk in his ways every day. He wants us to reflect him. But the work of God, which is adoption, let him do it, and let him do it as early as possible. And so I think there is a, uh, S3, uh, is a section in the Catholic Answers Bible, why does the church baptize infants? I just did a little brief answer, but there's much more in the book. This has been a consistent practice from the beginning. From the very beginning of the church, there's uh, references in Acts and everything where whole families were baptized. And it made no distinction about how old the people were. Whole families were baptized. And remember 3,000 the first day that Peter gave his homily. And it says that day 3,000 came in to be Christian, you know. And nowhere does scripture forbid baptizing infants. And like I say, God's doing the work. So, okay. All righty. What's our next one, please? That's that sacrament. Is there any high-level questions, folks, on baptism? It's the gate sacrament. It's really, really a gift from God. And uh, we're so happy, Jack. Uh, this, this might be a a tough or uncomfortable question, but uh, you, you were mentioning baptizing uh, baptizing infants in the in the incubator. And was, I mean, I couldn't help but thinking, what would happen to an infant that was stillborn or aborted? It's example? a very good question. You know, the church hasn't spoken on that, but here's the one we entrust them to the love and the mercy of Jesus. They didn't have a chance. Yeah. You know, there are, uh, when the woman doesn't deliver, what is that word when they're uh, Stillborn is one word. What's another one? Miscarriage. Miscarriage, right. Okay, so we, many times, the parents, if the baby is sizable, we would bury them and honor that, okay? And so we put them in, and, and we just pray for God's mercy, you know. we got to believe that God's mercy is there. Did they have original sin on this? Oh, yeah. They didn't have a chance. Remember Jesus said, let the little children come to me. and do not prevent that, okay? So we just entrust them to the love of God. So, yeah, you're right. But the comfort, you know, to have that done, the comfort on the parents' part is, you know. What I believe, what I believe, is if they were not baptized, they may have to wait. And we think of time and space, you know, we're in time and space, God is outside of time and space. But if they had to wait till the end of time before they entered heaven, did they still go? You know, so. But the immediacy uh, of, of being, uh, of dying in the state of grace where you're baptized at the moment you die, that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Would it be baptism of our blood for those instances? Well, it depends. It could be. You know, if like um, if if the heart had a heart attack and what I don't know. I don't. Know. I think baptism by blood would be where you're standing up for the faith. You're kind of a martyr. You know, like you're defending the faith. 
I, I wouldn't know that it would be just a physical condition. I don't know that that would be it. Unless someone, you know, abused the mother and the mother and the baby died or something like that. You know, that would be an attack on a Christian or something. That would be maybe baptism of blood. Okay. Okay, the second sacrament we want to talk about is confirmation, folks. And I think on your sheet there, that would be the second grouping there. Okay. So let's take a peek. Let's take a peek at confirmation. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and when you have the moments there to review that, it's, um, that would be a, a brief... The reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace, okay? Kind of amplifies the grace God gives us on the day of our baptism, okay? And so another reference there in our catechism, we're going to talk about two things, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and then the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So when we get gifts, how do they kind of blossom in us and kind of shine forth, okay? So there are, the, the, the Bible refers to seven gifts of the Holy Spirit in there and uh, in that in that passage and it's in Isaiah 11 and it's also in uh, the New Testament so what are the seven gifts here is wisdom understanding counsel fortitude knowledge piety and fear of the Lord I don't know if I put them on there but we have our children learn this you know when they make their confirmation it's usually about eighth grade okay and the greatest of the seven is wisdom. Oh my goodness, they have the wisdom of God. They have the wisdom to be able to know right from wrong and all of that. So there's seven gifts that God wants to pour forth of the Holy Spirit. And those are really worth receiving. And uh, so those would be the gifts that are uh, dispensed by God in the sacrament of mm -hmm. confirmation. And then the fruits of that, how that would show forth is charity, which is love, charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity, goodness, faith, mildness, temperance, you know, all of that. It'll show up. Remember Mother Teresa, do you guys? Remember Mother Teresa? Was there a, uh, a witness to peace? Was there a witness to charity? You know, she took care of the poorest of the poor. Was there a joy? Okay. So when the love of God reigns in your heart to that degree, when the Holy Spirit's gifts are in you to that degree, people just know that you're a godly person just by the way you show up, okay? And that's his hope is that we would show up in a dark world with this joy and this peace and this, this love that is just contagious and that it represents him, okay? Because he wants everyone. So there's a little bit of what's happening here is that's the full outpouring. And so let me just see if there's anything else. What's the next one, please, Joshua? Okay. You know, and, and this may be new to our Protestant brothers and sisters, you know, this baptism and maybe there is a communion and maybe there's bat uh, marriage as three sacraments so we're saying there's another. Here's just a few passages. In Acts, you know, <clears throat> Jesus says, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And there's this little distinction there. Okay, there's baptism, and then there's another level of the Holy Spirit coming. The distinction between the two is in Acts 8, and then Paul imposed hands on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. That's what the bishop does. The bishop puts hands on them and calls down the Holy Spirit to pour forth those gifts that I just referred to. And so when Paul went to some of them were baptized, they said, we've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. And then he confirms them and does that. So there are passages in scripture that would uh, be able to refer to that, okay? And uh, it's performed only once. On your, on your graphic there, there's only once. <coughs> Baptism is once, confirmation is once, okay? Beautiful. We normally do, like, a, a baptism is usually at infant's age for Catholics, and then around second grade, you know, they're seven years old or so, we call it the age of reason, and that's where they're aware that they can sin against mom and dad, disobey, lie, cheat, steal, and now they're able to make their first confession, where they admit that, and then they make their first Holy Communion, where they receive the Eucharist, that's the next sacrament, and then as far as confirmation, it's usually about eighth grade, eighth grade. And um, I guess the church has done that because it used to be you go to eighth grade, then you go into high school. And what a great way to go into this next level of your life with the strength of, you know, um, wisdom and understanding and, and prudence and just the good gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because then you're going to really have to stand uh, against maybe the world, okay? So there you go. And so when you do come from, when you receive confirmation, um, we use a holy oil that's used in the scriptures for healing called sacred chrism. It's olive oil blessed by the bishop with a in it. And so it's sacred chrism. And uh, like I say, the reason oil is being used is because it's a, a way of adding uh, 
uh, another level of gifts to the soul. And then that's the matter. That's the visible sign when a bishop or myself puts it on their forehead. And then I say, uh, we, we have a, a call, prayer calling down the Holy Spirit, and we say, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's the laying on of hands and the prayer. So that's the form. Again, it's oral. Be sealed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's a beautiful thing to see and to hear. And then if you folks are baptized and you wanted to become Catholic, then on the day you do that, then uh, the bishop or myself would put the oil on you and say, be sealed with the gift of gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that would be the formula that you'll hear right there. Okay. And uh, what are the effects? Okay. Three, three great effects. One is um, the full outpouring of the gifts we've talked about. It's a more intimate um, unity with Christ. You know, Paul says you become clothed in Christ. It's like putting on your favorite robe and you are in so much more uh, in union with Christ just by the grace of the sacrament of confirmation. And then we're perfectly bonded to his church. Christ is the head, we're the body. Christ is the bridegroom, we're the bride. And so we're more closely bonded with one another like that. So with the church, we're the church, the mystical body of Christ. And that's the effects of what happens all when we're confirmed. And uh, the next one there, please, Joshua. Who does that? It's usually the bishop. But on like Easter, we have 50 churches who are bringing people into the church, saying the bishop can't be at all 50 at the same time, and he delegates permission to the priest, the local priest, to go ahead and perform the sacrament of confirmation. It's a joy. And so that I would have the authority from the bishop for that occasion to go ahead and to uh, confirm um, the people. But when our students are confirmed, the bishop goes from church to church and picks all different times, and then the 8th graders or ninth or 10th graders, they come forward, and it's the bishop does it, or I do it as priest with the bishop. Okay, our next one, please, Joshua. Okay, and S2, and where is that in the Bible? And there's many sources, we looked at a few. I'm moving along because I want to cover Eucharist, which is the capstone. So of the three sacraments of initiation, this is the capstone right here, uh, the Eucharist. And so in the Catechism, a Catechism 1322, okay, the Holy Eucharist completes Christian initiation. Those who have been raised in the dignity of the royal priesthood of baptism, even the lay people, you know, your priest, prophet, and king as lay people, and configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation, participate in the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist, the bread of life. Okay. Okay. The Eucharist is what we call the sacrament of the sacraments. You know, I like to look at it this way, like a diamond, okay? And there's a statement that John Paul the Great said, it's like that the Eucharist, the Eucharist, is the source and the summit of the Christian life. It's the beginning and the end, okay? And we call it the most blessed sacraments. We said we have seven, right? And we're calling the Eucharist the most blessed. Why would that be? They're all blessed, okay? All seven sacraments are the power of Jesus. Why is this one called the most blessed sacrament? Because it is Jesus. So the little distinction is the power and the presence. Okay, okay. His power is dispensed in all three. Baptism, um, you know, uh, uh, confirmation, anointing, all of them, confession. It's the power of Christ. And then in the Eucharist, it is Jesus. It is Jesus. Failed under the appearance of bread. It is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Savior of the world so that we can be in communion with him. It's still the accident. The, the, the form is still bread, but the substance is him. Okay, It's him, not just his power. It's him. And that's why we call it, we have a shrine up in Hensville. Gosh, if you ever get the chance to go into our it's really, really worth seeing. And so they do a great job. They have a museum there. It's called the Museum of the Eucharist. And you go through it and you learn all of those, like 12 stations where you learn, oh, how God unveiled the Eucharist, Old Testament and New, that he wants to feed us with the flesh and blood of his son. And so uh, it's called the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. That's the name of it. It's called the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. You'll see the signs on, on the interstate on 65. Okay. Is the Eucharist necessary? Is this sacrament necessary? Of the seven sacraments, is it necessary? So we refer right away to the Gospel of John 
And in that gospel, in chapter 6, he has many references. And so Jesus said in verse 53, Amen, Amen. That's a profound, solemn declaration. Amen, Amen. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in you. So it's like, oh, you know, that's like a conditional thing. Unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you do not have life within you. And so this is done. He did this. He said this one year before he did this. One year before he's sitting at the meal, the Last Supper, which was the first Mass, where he took the elements of bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to him and said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup filled with wine, said the blessing, and gave it to him and said, Take a drink. This is my blood. And so from that moment on, he said, Do this. Do what? Do the Eucharist. Do this in memory of me. And so he gave us a vehicle, and it had to be like scales fell from their eyes. They had no idea how they were going to eat the flesh and drink the blood of this man. How are we going to do that? Okay, but and one year later at the Last Supper, when he did a miracle, and he said, Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. Ah, that's how we are in union with you in a holy communion, by taking this and having you change it into your body, and then we feed on you in a holy meal. That's how it happens. And it's just, oh my gosh, who would have guessed that he would have come with that, okay? And so let's please take a look at the, at the next one here. What is the matter and the form in that great sacrament, the Eucharist? Okay, the matter would be the bread. Remember, at the very elements they ate, they had unleavened bread, not leavened bread. And so to this day, the, the good sisters bake unleavened bread. And we use unleavened bread, and then we used wine. Remember, the four cups of wine were part of the Jewish Passover meal. And it was at that meal that he celebrated, and he platformed it into himself. And so the elements are bread and wine. Okay? And then the form would be, uh, here it is, the matter, and then the words of consecration. So at every Mass, I say what he said. I stand in his place, and I say, take this and eat. This is my body. Okay? Take a drink. This is my blood. Sure. So by the words that are said, I'm standing in the place of Jesus and holding the elements. Uh, this is what is called the words of consecration. The word consecrate means to set aside. So that element that was bread is now set aside as the body and blood of Jesus. And that's why we genuflect, and that's why we put it under lock and key and full box and all that. Because once the words are spoken, it is transubstantiated into the body and blood of Jesus, okay? So. Trans means across, and this is substance. It's a piece of bread, but across the whole substance of it in a miraculous way, in a mysterious way, it is now the body and blood. We say the body and blood, the soul and the divinity of Christ by his design. And so it's a great miracle that is performed every day at every Mass where he takes the elements and the Holy Spirit transubstantiates them into him so that we can feed on him and be nourished in a powerful way. Okay. Let's please take a look at the next one there, Joshua. Let's just see. What are the, uh, who does this? Okay, the bishop or the priest. Deacons do not have the authority. It's distributed by the deacons or an extraordinary minister. But who has the power to confect the sacrament? It's the bishop or the priest. Okay. What does it do? What are the effects of the Eucharist? Folks, you know we all sin. We sin every day. And so to come forward to receive the living Lord who is all holy and to have lighter sins on your soul, the, ele the sacrament of Holy Communion washes them away. You just told a white lie. You just let it slip and you said a bad word. You know, you had a, a bad thought or something. When you come forward and receive our Lord and Holy Communion worthily and are prepared, then it forgives, removes venial sin. It doesn't remove mortal sin. Remember what I said? Our union with God can be distorted. It can be weakened by light sin and it can be broken by a mortal sin where mortal means deadly. We don't ever want to do a mortal sin. Okay, and so, so to receive Holy Communion every day, that all of the sins that you did for that day that were lighter sins, wow. it's like having a clean slate every day. Every day. And there are people that know that. And they go to Mass every day. 
Give us this day our daily bread and renew me with your great power and your great privilege. Renew me by washing away my limitations. And then it strengthens us not to do it again. Okay? It preserves us from ongoing sin and it renews our kinship with God. Sanctifying grace. It bestows sanctifying grace to help us grow in holiness on our journey to be with him. Okay? Okay. Is the Eucharist truly the body and blood of Jesus? Well, there's many references there. You know, Paul, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 12. And so we don't have time to go into it, but I like to look at the church fathers, you know. If, if our Lord died in, uh, you know, 33, that's great. We have a lot, okay? So what happened in the first 100 years, okay? The hundreds, the 200s, and the 300s. So those men and women that lived here and wrote about the effect and the growth of the church, we call them the fathers of the church, the church fathers. And there's one man that died in 107, and his name is Ignatius, St. Ignatius of Antioch. He was martyred in Rome. He was spreading the good news of Jesus Christ and about this. And he said, the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The question is, is the Eucharist truly the body, blood, and soul and divinity of Jesus? And these men, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, were dead sure that what Jesus said at the Last Supper and what he allowed to happen at every time we pray Mass is truly continuing to happen. That the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Okay? And uh, it's a great thing. He wrote um, 11 letters to the churches at that time. We have all the letters. And so it's not scripture. But here again it is uh, what we call the fathers of the church and how that uh, lived out. Please, the next one there, Joshua. Why can't non-Catholics partake of the Eucharist? See, them, uh, some of our Protestant brothers and sisters in their churches, it's a sign of unity. It's a sign of remembering Jesus and things like that. So to them, it's a symbol. It's like a symbol. It reminds us of Jesus. To us, it's not a symbol. To us, it is him. Okay, there's a difference. And so for another a non-Catholic church to say, yeah, come on and participate in this meal. It's about the union that's there in the meal. That's fine if that's what you want to do. But since this is Jesus, even for a Catholic, as I say in this church over here, we must examine ourselves, as Paul said. He says it right real clearly. Let me just see if I can quickly. This is so important. Because it's not just about non-Catholics not receiving Holy Communion. It's about Catholics not receiving if you're not prepared to receive. Don't you dare receive this um, if, if you're not prepared uh, to do this. Let's see if I can... You're receiving the all holy uh, Son of God. This is 1 Corinthians, and we'll go and we'll start at 11:23. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11:23. If you want to write it down, you can look in your Bibles later. Here's what Paul says: For I, Paul, received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread. And after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and the blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are ill and infirm and a considerable number of you are dying. See, what Paul is saying is what I say at Mass time too. This is him. And don't you dare come forward and receive the all holy Son of God if there is a real hurt. You went out Friday and drinking and carousing and you did something bad, then you are in no position to come and receive God. And thank goodness God gives us the uh, avenue to be healed of grave sin. Okay? And that's confession. And that's a great sacrament that through through that great sacrament, uh, the Holy Spirit can uh, wash away mortal sin and venial sin. Okay? So this is not just a slam on non Catholics. Because non-Catholics maybe haven't known this, maybe they haven't prepared themselves, 
maybe they have a lifetime, and they're, maybe they're not baptized. I mean, there's so many reasons that it's not just about non-Catholics not receiving. And if you want to, there's a way. Yeah, we want you to feed on the bread of life, but you need to you know, make that declaration uh, that you want to be Catholic, and then you want to be repaired through the great sacrament of confession. If you're baptized, and you want to become Catholic, then the week before Easter, we guide you on how to make your first confession. And then you look at your whole life. You know, you may be 30 now, and since the age of 17, there's things that you did that you weren't happy with, that you knew were sinful. So you want to repent of those. And in a formal way, you ask God for forgiveness, and then you're prepared to receive your first Holy Communion on the day of Easter, okay? So it's very important that uh, preparation, okay? Is Jesus sacrificed again and again at every Mass? This is in your, in your book, Catholic Answers Bible, okay? And Jesus is once for all sacrifice. That's a once for all sacrifice. Okay, it's eternal. He's eternal. And so he is ever present before the Father saying, Abba, Father, look what I did for my brothers and my sisters. See, it's a sacrifice that doesn't end. It's eternal. And you can't repeat something that is eternal. What we do in the Mass is we enter into it and we participate in it. And so what I said here, Jesus is once for all sacrifice is eternal that we participate in in every Mass. You can't repeat something that never ends. And so the question is, is Jesus sacrificed again and again? Every time we pray Mass, are we doing that? No, no. He did that once for all, but it's never ending. That's what eternal means, ever present. He's ever present to the Father with his great act of love so that we can continue to get the healing uh, and the mercy that he so wants us to have. Okay. And then what's our next one, please? If we have one more question, I don't know. Okay. Okay, let me just see if we can wrap this up here, folks. And, uh, I hope that helps, folks, with regard to your notes there and everything. Like I say, at the very bottom, this, we celebrate Mass every day, and people can receive Holy Communion in the Eucharist every day. There's a little bit of a fast before, and I'll look into the details on that. So we've covered a lot, and if you have questions, please stay after. I'd be happy to help you, and I want to thank you so much for being here. And uh, please come again. We'd love to have you. What we do is we normally close with the glory, and then I'll give you a blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. And the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Be safe.